that sense. I would feel uh, incomplete to leave you, let, let you go without telling you this, right? So we don't have a lot of time in this school. And I hope everybody's paying attention. Please do not use commercial fragrances. Please don't do it, right? I'm going to tell you exactly why. I have, I have like 20 different reasons I can give you for why you shouldn't do it. But please don't do it. If you want to... If you want to smell good, or if you smell bad, and decide to do something about it, go take a shower. Take, change your clothes. Don't spray yourself with what's harming you. Don't spray yourself with smells worse than you already do. Just because you think it smells better. It does not smell better. Your subjective understanding is, is, is not benefiting you. And it's harming other people because when you wear this fragrance and you go to Mr. and you stand next to somebody, bro, they will they're ready to break their salon and leave. You do not want to do that. You do not want to put people in a position where they are this they can't breathe. They cannot stand a certain smell. Uh, and that is exactly what commercial perfumery will give you. Um, what is commercial perfumery? It is literally everything that is made in a factory that comes out, you know, ch that's churned out by the millions of bottles. Uh, Chanel, Louis Gucci, whatever, all of these names, right, these big names, that's exactly what you want to stay far away from. Why? Shaitan has a better access to you through them while you think that he doesn't, because what you think is you're applying thief and you're doing the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when you're really not doing that, and and a, and a really way, a good way to understand this uh, is a hadith of the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in which he says, at the end of time, truth will be mixed with falsehood, and that is such a such a such beautiful way to explain the circumstances that we live in today because Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm Al-Deen Iyaka Na'budu Wa Iyaka Nasta'een Ihdina Al-Sirat Al-Mustaqeem Al-Sirat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim Ghayr Al-Maghdubi Alayhim Walad-Dalleen Ameen Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Allahumma Salli Wa Sallim Wa Barik Ala Sayyidina Muhammad خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين على آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه أجمعين To begin with, you know, I would like to ask Allah I want to thank Allah for this opportunity for one for me to be able to sit here and talk to everyone here about something that I'm personally very passionate about you know Allah bestowed this great, great mercy and favor upon me that He allowed me to get into and experience the subtleties of this art and science called fragrance. It truly is an art and a science and its branches are far-reaching and its roots are deeply rooted in our tradition and culture, the culture and traditions of the Muslims. Many of the adv advancements that came to the field of perfumery came through Muslims. Methods of distillation, many different blends. You know, Muslims are individuals that over time, you know, we, we have this, this love for Allah. And that love for Allah translates into a love for His creation and appreciation for His creation. And we, specific group of individuals, the Muslims, have pioneered this art in a way that others have not. Um, and I want to start by, by, by giving you this introduction uh, and, and telling you that I have many different sides to present to you, you know, I want people to truly benefit and the reason why I feel like we are here today is not because of the virtue of me as a person because truly that is not the case and if you guys truly knew me you would not 
listen to what I have to say. However, this specific science I have studied and, and applies to every single person. You know, the science of fragrance, the nose. Each one of us has this organ, this, these senses. And we live in a time where we do not pay attention to this. It's, it, we've, brought, we've grown oblivious to the fact that we have a nose and that we constantly smell things and that these smells have some very, very serious impact on our perception, on our memories, on how we think, you know, how things influence us. You know, we live in a world where we're surrounded by angels and shayateen and jinn and so we ought to understand this very delicate science, this very specific ability that we have to perceive through scent. Um, so I have a lot of talking points listed here, but I have not gone very deep into reading through each one of them, so I'm going to try to do what I can, but I ask that you all be patient with me. I'm not some kind of scholar or someone who's very well versed in the science of hadith and all of these things, so I, I can only present so well, but inshallah with your patience and with a loving heart and a rational mind, each one of us sitting here can truly take home something very beneficial that we can use in our daily lives down to each moment you know i do i genuinely believe that i have certain advices and practical takeaways in this talk whereby down to the moment hour by hour with every salah with every different virtuous action that you can do i want to present i want to present a different perspective a deeper perspective a perspective of one where you you're doing things with a love and not merely just actions and not merely just things that people told you about but I want people in general to do actions with a little bit deeper thought a little bit of a deeper affection for this creation of Allah in general people when you interact with people I hope that you're able to deal with people in a deeper sense and not just what is physically apparent Sorry, I'm like going all over the place, but okay. um, So to begin with, is our body. You know, Allah created our body in a very specific way. It's a very, it's a very perfected form, and Allah calls people, you know, with the best of creation. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the best of example and creation. And we ought to take his message and his way of life and his perspective. And a good understanding of perfumery, of tib in general, of cleanliness and tahara is from the perspective of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is not something independent that the Rasul did not practice. No, not only did he practice it, but he promoted it and he held it in high regard and when he explained it to people, he explained it as if it was something that was held in very high regard. Now just another example, you know, Well, actually, never mind. I'll leave the example alone. I'm going to come back to that later, so inshallah, I'll mention that when we get there. But so the human body is perfectly designed for worship. The human body is perfectly designed for worship. Each and every organ, limb that we have, we see the way our limbs are designed, the knees, the arms, the, the folds, and the places you cannot do sajda or ruku or you couldn't pray if your body was designed any bit differently. But it is so perfect that it's almost as if the body was designed in its way specifically so that you could do your salah, you can do the various acts of worship and then thereby 
you know, achieve a great reward for it. The love of Allah, the approval of Allah, mercy of Allah, these are all things that you can attain by putting your mind to it, by putting your attention to it. So each organ in our body has a very specific role. Each organ system works together in unison in a way that contributes to your overall health. If that balance falls, if you, if you go just a slight bit out of balance, you see what happens to you physically. You see that you cannot do the basic tasks that you need to do. When a, you fall ill, you, you know, some bacteria or a viral infection, something as simple as a viral infection can completely take away your good opinion of the world. You know, you start seeing the world in a very different opinion. You start, you know, you just... Interest is taken away from you. Love is taken away from you just because your, your body fell out of balance and is not at its optimal functioning. So each organ has a, a very specific role and it is our job as people to make sure that our body is well maintained. You, you give it the nutrition it needs, you give it the, the, the comfort and the rest and the things that it needs so that you are able to engage in that worship, the constant worship, worship of Allah. That's something very interesting that, you know, I don't know how many of you have thought about this, but have you ever sat and pondered over how the sensory system works, how fragrance works, how the nose even processes a note into this experience, and how this experience then links up with memory, and then you form these, these extremely strong memories, you know? So I'll, I'll try to briefly explain it to you. You know, there is a constant, well for one, your nose is always on. You are always perceiving. You might get distracted from the fact that your nose is always on and you're always constantly perceiving through your nose, whether it's good or bad. But the fact is, that is what is happening. There is evaporation constantly taking place from everywhere. You know, uh, you walk in the field, the grass, you know, there's transpiration taking place, there's molecules that are up, up in the grass that evaporate up in the air and then you smell these things. It is not only air that you're smelling, you're smelling part and, and molecules that were inside of the leaves of the plants, they evaporated, they flew over to you, you smelled them and they had some kind of an impact. And this is taking place all the time, all the time, in your sleep. Your, your brain doesn't shut off, it is still working. You know, your body goes into a rest mode, but your senses, to some extent, are still working. You are not hearing as well as you were when you were awake, but you still are hearing. Your smell is not at that level that it was when, when you were awake, but when you are sleeping, it still works. If someone brings some rose around you when you're sleeping, you will perceive it in your dreams. You will. Your body will know that there's rose around me. How that works is a little bit interesting, but it happens. So the fact that we have this system, this nose, that we are always perceiving from. Now another interesting point that I have to mention, you know, fascinating, very fascinating, we see, right, we see light. Light comes in, hits our eyes, it translates into an image in our head. What we're perceiving is essentially light. Then we have ears, we're perceiving waves, sound waves, you know, these are molecules that are shaking and your brain over time understands what, like there's a word, in your mind you know what that word stand, stands for. So when I say it, you recognize that word. But it's essentially sound waves. One is light, one is sound. What about smell? Smell is neither of them. Smell is actually a physical molecule. It is a, it, it is, it is a particle that comes over to you that you absorb through your nose. 
this molecule then is processed by your brain and it so, gets stored inside of you. Eventually your body clears out because you know there's a constant process in the body going on whereby it's constantly clearing itself. However, your body physically it's a physical sensation more than simply a vibration or a light that you know um, light waves that hit your eyes. So it's a very physical experience. Whenever you smell something, it is something that is interacting with your body on a very physical level, unlike your hearing and your sight. So something very interesting to ponder over when you guys go back home, think about this because I find it to be something very interesting. It's a, it's a physical sensation, you know, unlike many other. Moving on, insha'Allah ta'ala, we ought to use our body, our senses, our limbs to connect with Allah because our mission here is to connect with Allah. The time that we are here, that we spend doing things, we ought to spend it in the remembrance of Allah. Because everything else is futile, and the only thing of value that will truly benefit you is the remembrance of Allah. Good actions that you did, good relationships that you held with people, these are the things of true value. And everything else is just kind of fluff in the air. So you ought to spend your time in the worship of Allah and you ought to actively use your body and use the gifts that you have been given to build and strengthen your relationship with Allah. Your body has a right upon you to be used for worship. You do not want your body to stand as a witness against you on the Day of Judgment. You want your body on the Day of Judgment to be used for you or in favor of you. You want your body to speak and say, this person did this, so and so good things. This person did prayed and, and you know engaged in worship and in good actions. And that's what you want, and you do not want your body to be used as a, as a, as a, you know, as something against you. Again, memories are deeply psychological processes. You know, these are linked on a very deep level within ourselves. And they could have a very negative impact or a very positive impact. Now you all can do a practical experiment with yourselves where you can think back to a time that was difficult or bad or, or, or troublesome. And you feel this, you feel a discomfort. It is not just in your mind, but a memory translates into a physical either comfort or discomfort in your moment, in your today. And so you ought to focus and, and try to implement practices and things that result in more positive impacts and, and, and things that have a positive impact in your life, on you, on the people around you, and engaging in things of worship and taking on tools that result in positive impacts and positive sensations rather than negative, you know. And so, if you want to take a path to Allah, it has to be on His terms. It has to be according to the methods that He prescribed and it can't be methods and ways that you come up with on your own. The love of Allah is earned through the following of the Messenger of Allah. Allah sent His Messenger وسلم, with certain practices, certain ways of approaching things and dealing with people. 
which is the very highest form that you can live. And that is the very thing that we are trying to achieve in our practices so that we may attain the pleasure of Allah. We don't just want good. We don't just want paradise. We want paradise, no doubt. Paradise is good. But we want what's higher. And what's higher than paradise is being close to Allah. Here and there being a beloved of Allah. Doing actions and, and engaging in things that are beloved to Allah result in being close to Allah. And if you just do bare minimum, you know, you, you do what you need to do and that's good and you will earn the pleasure of Allah. And you, you will, inshallah, each one of us earns paradise. We live in eternal felicity. But the love of Allah and the closeness of Allah on the Day of Judgment is something else and that requires effort in this world. Real effort, real struggle, and real mujahida. You know, there are there's there's a hadith in which Prophet ﷺ spoke of a man, there was a man that entered the masjid, and the Prophet ﷺ that is, said that that is a man of God, that is a man of paradise. And so the people went and observed him and observed his ways, and they found that he did nothing different than what everyone was doing except for one action which was that he used to go to sleep at night without harboring any ill feelings towards other people aside from this he did everything that everyone else did he did the five salah he he was an upright individual but he didn't do too much he wasn't like the certain other sahaba that that went in he did what he had to do. However, Prophet ﷺ referred to him as a man of paradise. We can tell from this, you do these basic things, you do not hold ill feelings towards people, and if you do, you repent from it before you sleep, you will be a man of paradise. These are the words of Rasulullah ﷺ. However, the love of Allah and the proximity to Allah, closeness to Allah, that is something that requires serious mujahida, serious struggle. Here, in every action, you, you fight your nafs, your desire. You know, we live in a world where our nafs and our desire is so emboldened, it's so, it's so crazy. The system that, the, the, you know, like we live in, a, in the Dajjal's the time. This is the time of the Antichrist, the Dajjal. Every prophet till date has spoken about this Dajjal and this fitna to come. Prophet وسلم, on many, many, in many narrations, he warned his people, he warned of the afflictions and of the evil and of the trials and tribulations that would come to the people during the time of the Dajjal, and that is today, right? If there's anyone who thinks that this is not the time of the Dajjal, this is the time of the Dajjal. The, 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 the system, the commercial world that we live in, the industrialization, the convenience, the social media, I mean, in every way, we are surrounded by the Dajjal, Shaitan's evil, Shaitan's mischief, everything that they could possibly do to take us away from the remembrance of God, they're doing it. They're putting their full effort, and this is this is the time to truly take your own actions into account and to take account of why you're doing things and what you need to do more carefully. As Muslims, there are certain character traits that we ought to imbue into ourselves. There are certain traits that we as men, as men of God, as men of 
knowledge, as men of love, and as men of insight, Muslims, you know, there are certain actions that we ought to excel in. Not just focus on, but truly excel in. The idea of being grateful. You know, Allah has blessed us with so many gifts, so many mercies. This body that we have, subhanAllah, we ought to be so grateful for it that in every moment, we ought to give thanks to Allah for the fact that we're alive, for the fact that we didn't just suddenly die or we just suddenly didn't disappear or vanish into thin air. You know, each, each limb, each gift, every single thing, every breath that we take, we ought to, as Muslims, give thanks for it. Because truly, we don't deserve it. Allah can take it away from us, there's nothing we can do about it, right? It's not, it's not Allah's job to keep us alive, it's not, you know, however, it's a mercy that was given to us, and because Allah is merciful enough, to give us this gift, we ought to be grateful for it. And that gratefulness manifests in many different ways. You know, there are many things that you can do to show your gratefulness to Allah. One gratefulness is a, the gratefulness of your heart in, your, in, in, in the very deep sections of your heart. You are grateful, truly grateful for what you have. And that's one, and that's good, and you ought to experience it to the full, you ought to focus on it. However, there is another gratefulness that's shown physically to people. You, if you're grateful with a gift that's given to you, you pass that on. That's gratefulness because Alhamdulillah, you got it. Now you're increasing it by giving it on to somebody else. Humbleness. We all ought to seriously be really humble in our approach to life in general, you know? We cannot be individuals who think we know it all because, wallahi, the truth is that we do not know, know, we do not know it all. And there's somebody else, an elder or a sheikh or somebody who knows far more than us about down to every specific thing. There are people that know more of each subject than us and so, there's no rational argument for you to be a man of arrogance and pride as if you know everything. You don't know anything. You don't know everything. You might know something and mashallah, alhamdulillah for those gifts, Allah gave you knowledge and understanding of something, alhamdulillah. You ought to be grateful, you ought to be humble for it. But if that knowledge that you have takes you into arrogance and pride, you ought to reconsider. You ought to sit and and talk to yourself. Talk to Allah. Give thanks, you know. In Islam, there's this concept of himma. Being men of himma, high himma. Now, unfortunately, maybe Sheikh Amr or Sheikh Tamer can give us a better understanding of what it means to be men of high himma. But a very integral part of being a Muslim, not just being a Muslim, being a Muslim in today's day, when the evil is just too strong, it, we, we really ought to think about what it's going to take to become men of high himna, we ought to make some sincere dua. Ask Allah for himna. Ask Allah for the ability, for the for the strength and the ability to persevere through this terrible time that we live in. Shauq. We as Muslims ought to have shauq. We as Muslims, again, this is a, uh, you know, not something that I can explain very well. Inshallah, Sheikh Omar, Sheikh Tamar can explain what shauq really means. But wanting to know the truth, wanting to know what is really real, and wanting to know 
wanting to know by itself, we ought to inculcate that into our lives. We ought to become men of shulk for Allah, for shulk for His Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, shulk for His religion and for the ways that He prescribed, shulk for the world that He created, the I mean, subhanAllah, the world is so vast and so great. There is just so much going on. Allah created so many different things. Allah created so many different animals and plants, each one with a particular benefit. I mean, if you want to talk about plants, there are millions upon millions of species of plants that have very strong medicinal value very strong medicinal value. I mean, we live in a world where, you know, pharma companies are making a lot of money, right? Off of putting things together and then selling them to you. But that is not uh, how we as Muslims traditionally approached healthcare, you know? Traditionally, healthcare in Islam involved natural products consuming natural things living in a natural environment going out into nature you know at the times of the ottomans subhanallah when when you know when ish, people had certain issues one of the kind of therapies they had was nature therapy so they would send you into a jungle and going into a jungle somehow subhanallah cures your problems amazing Fragrance, fragrance therapy, where they would give fragrance to a person to smell and suddenly he's all all right. Nature, natural products, having a show for what Allah created and put value in, medicinal value, different kinds of value, but we ought to have this, this wanting to know what Allah created, wanting to experience what Allah created, and wanting Allah through His messengers, through the messenger of Allah sallallahu, uh, through, uh, through the messenger of Allah, uh, uh, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He told us about the benefit of certain things. He told us the value of certain things. And we as Muslims ought to go out and experience them. Firstly, we ought to go out and find out what these things even are. What is musk? Why or what, what is jasmine? You know, why should I eat this particular thing? What's the benefit in this? We ought to go and find that out for ourselves. That's shok. That's that 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 comes from having a love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that then translates into us going out and acting on it. But for the people that are not concerned for these things, you ought to realize and understand that you should. You should, as a Muslim, as a person who is following the religion of the Prophet of Allah wasallam, you ought to <coughs> look into what he did, what, what he ate wasallam. What he wore, why he wore it, how he wore it. I mean, you can get so specific with so many things, but these are all branches that come out of having the love for the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and wanting to be close to him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I made this little parable up. I did not find this. Uh, it's not really a, a quote from uh, a teacher or anything. But I spoke a little bit earlier about doing the bare minimum and how you can do the bare minimum and that's good. But a parable for someone who does bare minimum is someone who is just afloat. You're floating. You haven't drowned but you're not really doing very well because if you were doing very well, you'd be swimming at a very fast pace. But you're not swimming at a very fast pace. You're just floating. That is someone 
who does bare minimum. What is bare minimum? Bare, bare minimum is the fara'il, the pillars of Islam, following things and making sure that, you know, following the essentials of the deen and making sure you do them well. That's the bare minimum, right? Like your five salah, the wudu before the salah, all of these things, there's no, there's no negotiation. You have to do them. But if you do these things, you, you'll earn a certain position. But the parable of a man who is um, close to Allah, or a man who is loving and, and caring for the ways of Allah and that of the Messenger وسلم, he is one who engages in extra actions, extra deeds, not bare minimum, but you stay up at night, or you do certain things, or you, you go out and you meet people and you engage with them in a way that is pleasing to Allah, that will elevate your status and bring you closer to Him. Don't be of those that are just afloat. I mean, it's good to be afloat because at least you're not drowning. At least you're not dying. At least you're not gasping for air, thrashing around, going crazy just because you're drowning. You don't want to be the one that's drowning. At least be afloat. But if you really want to excel, then you have to be those. Like the parable is that of the man that's swimming. You have to be swimming. You have to get into a stride and you have to maintain that stride part of that is consistency it's not doing an action one time it's doing it over the course of time and truly again I'm gonna mention something here perfumery oils right specifically you smell them once that is not even a fraction of, of what you can attain from that oil. If you have an oil and you really want to benefit from it, you need to keep it for at least two to three months. Use it daily, over a few period, over days, over weeks. You, you, you make some kind of a schedule with how you use it. You take an oil, you associate it with a certain action, and you do that for not just a, a day or a week, or you do it for months. After a month of using that oil, that's when you will start to realize things about that oil and about how, how, how the system works. But if you do not give it time, you smell it once and you expect something to happen or you just expect to suddenly feel really well, that's, 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 not, that, that's not the case, right? You have to istiqama. You do this over days, weeks, and months, and after you've developed some kind of understanding, that's truly when its benefit will start to show. But up until then, it'll be this half experience where it smells good, but that's it. But I'll, I'll touch on that later, inshallah. Um, the smelling good aspect. All right, it's an interesting one. We live in the time of the Dajjal. We live in a time when Shaytan is really, really strong. Shaytan, Satan, the devil, he is working over time. Two shifts, three shifts, or more over time and everything. He is putting all 24 hours of his day towards destroying your life. He wants to see you in the worst and most miserable condition. He wants to make sure that you do not attain that felicity, that eternal happiness and comfort that's afforded to many of the scholars and the, the people of Allah. He was once in a position where he got to see all of these things, but then he was thrown out. And you do not want to be of those people that fall into his waswasas, wasawas, 
and then are led astray by him. You want to be of those people that counter what he says, then that work against what he tells you to do. And this t time period that we live in is the very worst that humans have ever seen till date. The most difficult period of time the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that this would be the most difficult period of time. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says it, this is the worst time. This is the most difficult time. Worst, you know, it's a little harder to understand that, but the most difficult in the sense that uh, Hadith mentions it'll be like holding on to hot coals. For us today, doing certain deeds of worship is like holding on to hot coals. You know, there was a brother I was reading on the chat. Um, he mentioned about how wearing a kufi to school, he's sitting here, but um, how it, it, it's resulted in lash, uh, backlash. It's resulted in people seeing him a little differently. You know, people looking down upon him or cer certain things like that. And that's, that's a perfect example of how if you are practicing Muslim today and you go out, you're shunned and you're looked down upon. And so truly, the words of Nabi والسلام, came true because today we see that following Islam, at least from a perspective, of, you know, is literally like holding hot coals. It's hard, it's hard, it's hard. Shaytan, Satan, was given many gifts at one point in his life. He had a high position. But because of something that he had in his heart, a way that he thought, he lost everything. He lost everything to the extent that he is right now taking millions of people with him into that into that life of eternal burning, suffering, never coming out. Eternal, eternal, right? Like, it's, it's hard to imagine eternal. You can imagine 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, about at like 100,000, it gets hard to imagine time, right? A million. 10 million, it just keeps going, keeps going. There's no end, there is no end. If you're on this side, there's no end to how happy you can be. There's, you keep rising in ranks, and you keep rising in ranks, and it's everlasting happiness and felicity. And then it, on this side, it's everlasting suffering, and more and more and more suffering, and it just keeps going and going. And that's the fate of Shaytan. The one who had such a high status at one point in time that the angels used to look at him and be like, dude, what's going on here? You know, you're not one of us. Uh, but Allah allowed him to rise to that rank and then he was thrown out. He was flung out and he, he was eternal damnation. And so these traits that he had those of pride and those of arrogance, these are the very traits that we ought not to have in us, lest that we end up being exactly like him and having his fate. We don't want that. And the approach, and, and the reason I mention this here is because with regards to perfumery, there are a lot of ways in which you will fall into this. You will experience Things You know, you'll have trials and tribulations where this idea of pride and arrogance of what I have is the best. What he has is whack. <laughs> you already know. Uh, Think about uh, the position that I'm in. It's, wallahi, it's difficult, man. But, <laughs> but 
we ought not to have these in us because because the result is is a very bad end. And may Allah protect us all. Secondly, Shaytan, he knows you very well. Each one of us, he knows us very well. He has seen humans over a long period of time. He has misguided many, many, many of us already. So he's achieved the goal that he wanted to achieve with many people, right? We know this because we see how they, their lives ended. We see how they lived their lives. We see today how many people lived their lives. So clearly, in the case of many people, Shaitan is winning, right? So he knows you very well. He knows you inside out. He knows how your body works. He knows how your body interacts with different things. He knows how your body reacts to certain foods that you eat. And his, he knows very well how your body reacts to certain fragrances that you wear. He's well aware of this. He knows what oud is. He knows what musk is. Let's not live in this ignorance that he, he somehow doesn't know about these things. No, he knows very well. And so how do we engage with these things knowing that our enemy is preventing us from using these things? He is very well aware of all of the subtleties in your life. He knows how to attack you and just what it's going to take to ruin you on an in, like you as each each there's everyone here is an individual. Everyone is different and everybody has a different approach to life. Everybody has a different perspective. But he has a very special thing for each one of you where he knows that you like a certain thing and he's going to use that against you. So bring to your mind and, and understand the fact that many of these things, many, many, many actions and, and, and things that we engage in are also ways where he can get you. So specifically, talking about perfumery, you ought to use what's real, natural, and, and, and good, because what is not is his tool against you. I'm gonna leave that there, and I'm gonna touch on that later, because I'm gonna break some hearts by saying certain things because hopefully people will understand some things that will result in a, in, a, in a changed understanding and perspective, right? So we are singled out targets. Each one of us is a singled out target that there is some kind of entity that is out to get us, that is out to affect us. We know this, right? Especially in the time that we live in today. Because if we lived in a time many years ago, it probably would not have been as bad. But the war specifically, the last 20 to 30, 40 years, it has been the worst time possible. With the rise of the internet, global networking, the ease of, you know, the convenience. You can sit here, order whatever, like, and it, you know, from Russia, and it comes here in four days. This was never the case for people. You know, even specifically with, with Ayn, you know, people would travel long distances. People will travel from one part of the world to the other to hear one hadith. 
they would go, travel across the desert without food or water. You know, they would have very minimal provisions. They would go through a very real struggle just to hear one hadith. Right now, we can pull up the whole Bukhari Muslim. Any any kitab you can think of, you can pull it up right now, and, and you can just start reading from anywhere. This wasn't a luxury that was afforded to the time before us. Thousands of thousands of years have passed of human history, and we, we our our generation, sixty years, a time period of sixty years for us, has changed everything. We live in a completely different time period and, and, a, and a way of living than the generation before us. And even the generation before us, they will tell you that they do not have these luxuries that we have. The luxury of, of fast travel, of convenience, of, you know, many different things that from a perspective work to the benefit of shaitan. They do not work to our benefit. We think that having all of these kitabs on our phones and having access to them whenever we want is something good for us. From a perspective, yes, because you can pull it up immediately. And so from that perspective, it's good. But really, having access to everything is not good for us because now we don't know how to sort through all of these things. We don't know what to read and what not to read, who to read from, what is a good source, what is not a good source. Everything is presented the same way. The person's name is Sheikh so and so and he's saying these things. Now you have to really put in an effort uh, you know, to kind of authenticate what you're even reading because it could be the case that what you're reading is completely false, which is the case with much, much of the information on the internet, specifically uh, pertaining to our sciences. In the sciences of Islam, there's a lot of uh, material out there that we do not, that's not a part of our tradition, uh, but it's out there. So it's very difficult to sort through these things. And so it is very difficult for us and the time period that we live in, as opposed to the period before. People before took their knowledge from other people. You know, Perfumery specifically, you wanted to buy something, you would go to a person and he would give it to you. Not you, you know, go to a website, you order something, you don't know what it smells like, you base it off a description. This wasn't the traditional way the trade took place. And so this is a very shape, a very Dajjalic system that we have, that we ought to be tread carefully and be very specific in our approach to these things. Now these oils have been sitting here for a while, so inshallah I'm gonna send some of these around. I said there will be time for questions before I share Yes, inshallah, yeah, for sure. generous in your application of these perfumes. If you want to be, uh, make sure it's some money coming my way, inshallah. If you want to apply it, that's okay. Just don't be too generous. Apply, no problem. I made 
You know, I, I just noticed something when Cam Smith, he shut his eyes. And I know in the in Kosovo, they say one of the signs of like real experience is it forces you to shut your eyes. Whether it's good or bad, it's just like you're really experiencing something. So when you smell something really good, it makes you shut your eyes. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Like that, you notice that teaching come on? Huh? But if it smells, like Zahir says, if you, if you look at the... If you look at the drink after you sip it, it means you really like it. What is this? It's a sign that it's good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's it. That's probably a few hundred right there. I said, while they're passing around, can I ask something? Yeah. So I noticed, uh, you said you said something really important about using the same oil for a long period of time. Yes. Now, I also noticed, but I was never really able to assess, like, to what degree. But I noticed different ones like the right facts. Mm -hmm. So, is there, like, is there, like, solid studies based on the person? And the reason I'm asking, as I actually noticed with women in particular, they may like a certain scent at a certain point and at different time of uh, the month or if they're in a different mood, they, they, they don't like that smell. No, really, like there's something going on between their state and scent and they can kind of like tell us more about ourselves because we don't have as much sensitivity. You know what I'm saying? And I do remember one of my shakes saying that you should really use oud and muratava and intention time. There's a long time that I heard him say that, specifically oud. So is there like, is there some research that you know, like the higher notes, the more floral do these, the more like... You know there is, there is, uh, I mean, it's not, there's not one published study, you know, there are different works where you can look at what people, uh, how people approach this. Although, to your point, you know, Shit Rahim right, mentioned this, mood uh, is a, it greatly affects how you experience okay, then how do we know what mood, like let's say we're excited, we're feeling, we're feeling, feeling down, lift up. Um, it's, it's just like food has certain effects. I know this person. Right. I have a point mentioned here, but basically it's trial and error because this, it could be any aromatic. It's also rooted in the habit. So once you know the habit for a certain thing, then that starts to work for you. And it not, might not necessarily work for you. So, you know, food is, is a, again, food is not fragrance. To me, food is not fragrance. It is purely medicine, and it ought to be used as medicine for a very specific purpose. Um, I don't consider it food a fragrance. I think it is. However, there is, and things like that, that I can understand how it has this fragrant effect. But specifically when it comes to food, I don't think food is I think food is really medicine. Food is straight medicine. With, with specific purpose. What do you feel like? You know what you're going to do? This can you toss out here so that you guys can smell? Oud's uh, tree is from it's from the tree. Uh, I mean, I don't know. He's, he is mixing. I'm wearing Oud right now. I'm wearing Oud right now. But I don't know if it's a blend. It has it has nothing. No, it's a certain tree. When it dies, then it gives up the smell. Then it feels like what's under the bark. I think it's like it's like a layer of the bark on the and then they they uh, boil it. It's like a process. Yeah. That oil that you had was also oil. The one I'm wearing now? No, no, the, the bottom of the oil. These are all very different kind of oils, different vintage. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is the one we got. We split this one. Yeah, I use this. I have it on right now. Yeah, 1975. This is nice. That's my green one. And that's a very, very nice one. You know, when I first got that, it was like, it's not a lot. This is actually, it's very liquid. Yeah. Is this one in sleepers tonight? 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 Is this one in 
you know, you know, that's not the other thing that I realized. The, uh, that, you know, the power of scent is in your because you realize it with the negative aspect. When you have a bad smell, it makes you so sick. Yeah. Yeah. And that, like, one time I remember smelling something, maybe we don't act that same access to the smell, but the opposite is like, you can walk through the smell. I don't know. 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 I incomplete to leave you, let, let you go without telling you this, right? So we don't have a lot of time, and I hope everybody's paying attention. Please do not use commercial fragrances. Please don't do it, right? I'm going to tell you exactly why. I have, I have like 20 different reasons I can give you for why you shouldn't do it. But please don't do it. If you want to... If you want to smell good, or if you smell bad, and decide to do something about it, go take a shower. Take, change your clothes. Don't spray yourself with what's harming you. Don't spray yourself with smells worse than you already do. Just because you think it smells better. It does not smell better. Your subjective understanding is, is, is not benefiting you and it's harming other people because when you wear this fragrance and you go to Masjid and you stand next to somebody, bro, they will, they're ready to break their Salah and leave. You do not want to do that. You do not want to put people in a position where they are, they can't breathe. They cannot stand a certain smell. Uh, and that is exactly what commercial perfumery will give you. Um, what is commercial perfumery? It is literally everything that is made in a factory that comes out, you know, ch that's churned out by the millions of bottles. Uh, Chanel, Louis, Gucci, whatever, all of these names, like these big names, that's exactly what you, what you want to stay far away from. Why? Shaitan has a better access to you through them while you think that he doesn't, because what you think is you're applying thieb and you're doing the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when you're really not doing that, and and a, and a really way, a good way to understand this uh, is a hadith of the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in which he says, at the end of time, truth will be mixed with falsehood, and that is such a such a. Such a beautiful way to explain the circumstances that we live in today because a commercial fragrance house will sell you this bottle that they say smells good every single aromatic that's in like every single aromatic com compound that's in there is either toxic or uh, at the very least like very harmful you know but more generally it's toxic it's an immunosuppressant, it is carcinogenic, it affects your perception, it affects your mind, it affects your uh, vitality, it, ex it is an all-round horrible thing to do. But, so how does it work? Why is everybody still doing it? It's so subtle, its effect on you is so subtle, but sure enough, it is there. And 
It's only over time that you realize when your organs start failing or when you start having these rashes and all these serious physical <laughs> implications of using things, that's when you're going to wake up and realize, oh, I shouldn't use candles, I shouldn't use deodorant, I shouldn't use this commercial perfumery. I know boys are like looking around, but the truth is that the, the, the jalic system is such the control of this digestive system is so deep. The food we eat, all of the food we eat is pretty much no good. Except for what's made in our houses where our families, mashallah, may Allah bless them, they do, they're doing their thing. But apart from that, this culture of going to restaurants and buying food on the go, uh, you know, snacking from the corner store, that's not a life you want to live because all of the ingredients in the food that you're eating, yes, hackies, that's your, that's your number one enemy right there. Because that's you said candles, this guy was like, he didn't tell me that before I became Muslim. <laughs> he likes his candles. This there's, good good, there's good ones. Yeah, so you, can, you can find the good ones. But generally, any, anything that's just out there is yeah. very hard. So you we can't eat deodorant? Have you read what's on the label of deodorant? We might be Muslim. What you use? <laughs> what you use, brother? What you use? What you use? What you use? I should use. Oh, for my underarms, there's a specific deodorant that I have. Use that's use fragrance free, no, and that is made of shea butter, and it has no fragrance at all. It's, yeah. it's called Hello or something like that. It's in Target. Wait, so so is that is that like that's just something you like instead of like regular deodorant you need to get that kind? Of? Uh, I mean, Wait, what do you, know you can do whatever you want. It's just what I would advise for you is to get something yeah. that's fragrance free. What's it called? Hello, or something like it's like a white bottle. You can look up like frequency. Yeah, that's one. But this has a blue cap. It works wonders for me. No, but you're 100 percent right. Food, music, everything. It's like there's the pure version, which is less and expensive and hard to get. And then there's like the mass-produced version, like the McDonald's of everything. McDonald's of perfume. McDonald's of you know. All of these brands are making so much money off of this. Mm -hmm. They're selling a dollar product for a hundred dollars. And these perfumer, I mean, is this the name? It's a name. It's yeah, a brand. It's a brand. That's exactly what it is. You can't patent nature. So that's the problem. They have. You can't patent nature. So they have to make something different. Than right. Right. Absolutely. Right. They make synthetic versions of the natural things, and then they sell them. There are all kinds where you can make something better than here. They don't even buy it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're just, everyone's out to make money at the expense of your health. And you're the fool that's pretending like you're having a great time because you're smelling good. Or uh, smell good. Exactly. Exactly. And that's a whole nother point. Yes, but you think. All right. Inshallah, we'll be closing right now. Uh, stay tuned for next time. Is the prices of the food? Can we bring it to that tiny? That's like you set it on the table at the table. It's tiny. It's a rock. But it's tiny. It's a rock. But that's a tiny. But that's a tiny. I'm going to go with it. What do you want? Please help us out. Why don't you guys help us out right here? To the best of us to know that there is a niche within perfumery that is the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and contrary to popular belief commercial perfumery does not fall under the category of tea but at least to my at least to me right. at least in my tea. perspective yes, yes, yes. it's 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 made in a lab it's added to alcohol and then it's sold to you telling you that this is perfume it's not that's, that's not at all the case um, Thieb is when a natural aromatic. That's what the word itself means. Yeah. Thieb, 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 means thieb, comes, natural. thieb comes from thieb. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's pretty obvious. Yeah, subhanAllah. And it's it's literally, you don't tinker around with it. You take it You take it from it, from it, uh, take it from nature as it is, and you use it as it is. You don't introduce your own. Right, you just distill it. Exactly. You, just distill, you it. distill it and you use it as opposed to commercial perfumery which is all about trademarking, blending uh, and coming out with your own signature thing <coughs> that the opposite brand doesn't have and there's this fight between brands and that's not that's not the way to approve, uh, you know, 
enjoy perfumery, the way to enjoy perfumery is to directly take it out of nature and uh, and experience it, experience it in conjunction with salah and your good deeds and acts of worship uh, and that's where the real enjoyment of these things is and uh, as a Muslim you know these these are things that we should be focusing on and uh, you know just like Sheikh, uh, you know you, you said earlier uh, get out of your own head you know you're, you're living in a life that is concerning to only you you ought to be more concerned for other people and so this is a tool that you can use to, to put you in that mode to put you into that mode, you have something to share with people, something that's of real worth. You're able to get give that, and you're able to receive back. Uh, you know, you're able to perfumery. Essential oils are such a strong tool as a, as as dawa. It's a very strong dawa tool because you're able to convince people of things just w without talking. I think you know? fragrance is such a good way of doing dawa too. Yeah. Actually. It really is. If you give a non-Muslim a bottle of Islamic fragrance, yeah. because it's natural, they might get more attached to it yeah. than what they have at home, right? Yeah. And then you can also tell them that the fragrances you wear, you know, create cancer and all sorts of right. problems, and this is natural, and this is like directly from nature. Yeah. It's closer to the fitrah as opposed to commercial perfumery, which is very far from the fitrah. It's like exactly what you don't want to do. Uh, but the way that th you know our lives are organized is like we take that as like exactly what we want to do, and we have this, un this twisted understanding that that sunnah, which which you know I, I hate to say, but it's it's really uh, deception. It's deception, and it's leading to. So, can you give us a breakdown of these different um, oils Absolutely. that we have? Here? See, I am a. I am the biggest fan of uh, Ensar. I highly encourage everybody okay, to so buy Ensar's products. Okay, so if somebody wants products. to get one of these from you, if they're in the U.S., then they could probably... Would you do people outside U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. I do uh, within U.S. I do outside, I do FedEx and DHL outside of the U.S. Usually what's your email? Or what's how do people contact you? My email is... Um, I can give you my instagram i can give you my email too that works but i can give my phone number i'm not i'm not really sure i'm i do all maybe of them, instagram so. might be better more i have an instagram page that's devoted specifically to perfume what is it called it's called Thebe. Thebe n y Thebe dot n y like how do you spell Thebe? t e e b Thebe dot n y dot n y on instagram York. and then it's uh, called the Thebe company that is my company that is my brand and inshallah that i plan to grow and uh Okay, so what do we have here? What are the different types of things we got? So right here we have agarwood. This is oud, khashab al oud. This is the actual part of the tree that's resonated. And then these pieces are, you know, like the, it's, it's cut into sections and then the white wood, which is what you don't need, is stripped away. And then what you get left with is the chips. Uh, these chips are densely packed with resin. And it's the resin that smells really nice. And it's the resin that then when distilled becomes the actual oil. Uh, the chips by themselves don't mm. smell too much. Yeah. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It's really, it, depends it really depends. Um, but this is then distilled and turns into an actual oil. Uh, the price of oil is astronomically high compared to wood. I mean, wood oil prices start- The real stuff. A, the real stuff, they yeah. start at 100 for a gram and go into well like five six thousand dollars for the gram the gram i'm not talking about full bottles mm -hmm. so that is oud oil a lot of other stuff that i have includes my blends you know i have blends here um i have frankincense i have frankincense oil you know i'm a big believer in frankincense and using luban it also appears in uh in narrations um yeah luban uh, uh yeah uh, was it Ibn Arma? Uh, there was there was a sahaba that used to burn a pound of that's literally is mentioned in the in the hadith. They, he used to burn a pound of Luban every Friday in the masjid of the Nabi So this was uh, a, this is one of the one of the famous sahaba. I just can't remember the name right now. But every Friday he used to burn a pound. Of the band, so it's not just like you light a little bit, like yeah, you really did this. It's a pound of the band, that's what's mentioned there. So, 
uh, that in itself holds a lot of meaning. Uh, okay, very good. I'm sure. So yeah. Alright, okay. Asad, give me the rundown. What would you like to know, Shif? Everything that you like to describe. It's uh, like it's uh, incense. It's all part of the Tlaib culture. Uh, you know, mm. like the Islamic culture of perfuming and tahara and piety. And uh, these are ways where we can achieve it. I have a really nice blend here, Shif. Do you want to try it? Sure. I'm going to apply it to you directly. I'm not even going to. You're gonna love this. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. This is like my meditation oil. This is what I would wear if I were to sit and do dhikr or something. How much is this? I am not sure right now. Shasma, I have to. I have that's to fine. You heard too much. I have you? a lot. <laughs> I feel bad taking so much of your stuff. No, here. Stuff, uh, bro, People that's were taking so much. Instantly said how much is. <laughs> that's how it is. Mindset. I need to. Nice. Yeah, and this is, bro, like, this is this one, really and one oil is enough to, like, uh, keep you occupied through the day, and, you know, there's, like, there's a variety for that reason where your senses are, you're enriching your senses and your perception. It's like you're making your vision more colorful and your, your mindset more colorful, as opposed to, like, a black and white light where it's just, mm. like, you wake up, you work, and you go to sleep, and there's no appreciation or enjoyment of life. Mashallah, mashallah, this is great. This is great. I think it was very important for people to know that to invest in a uh, real natural theme right. rather than uh, artificial fragrances. Right. And uh, it also allows the shaitan to affect the people. Um, you know, it, it uh, causes cancer or just a whole bunch of things and so I think this is very important for people to know right. and try to make this part of their culture you know mm -hmm. the, when you get shower and everything you know, wear your clothes you got your like you know ataran or ataran. Yeah, you have to you have to and you mentioned a really really good point of, of dawah and we as Muslims you know our, our first job is dawah and our like the yeah. purpose is, is to make sure that any interaction we have we're able to communicate to people that you know Allah, believe in Him, and uh, and I really think that perfume, good perfume, is one of oh. those tools. Oh, okay. yeah. is, it, is Bahur like in the same category as this? That, 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 that. So Bahur would be um, agarwood. Uh, it's like kind of like what blends are in oil. That's what Bahur is. Uh, where uh, technically, what's the translation for the word Bakhar? Uh, to uh, I, I I think that. Uh, you know, it's a it's a blend of different things based on the word. Generally, like you have bahur, like that stuff. Yeah, the stuff that's it's, okay, it, every day. Right. It's blends, generally synthetic blends, because you know, like a, a brand is making them and, and mass producing them. So they're using uh, low quality wood as the base for the shavings, and then they add the uh, you know blends to it to make it smell nice. They make mamuls of it, then you burn that. Uh, that's generally what Bukhur is. It's very interesting because the nose is one of the most moral of our senses. Mm -hmm. Meaning, when you smell something bad, it's probably najas, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's something good, it's probably something good. I mean, there are exceptions, right? Mm -hmm. but, but what the West has done is it's created the deception of creating something that smells good mm -hmm. on the outside, but it's really not. And what's, what's also very interesting is that this also brings the angels closer and makes shaitan run away. So, and it's sadaqah. Somebody's having a bad day and they go by you and they smell the, you know, the natural smell. It'll like affect their... So it's sadaqah. And there's no like... There's no... Uh, there's no and perfume. There's no I didn't even talk about that. That's a whole. That's a whole topic in its own. You can spend. You cannot spend on a lot of things uh, because it, it becomes. Well, Allah is not going to say why did you spend so much on fragrances. Right. You can only buy one car, maybe two, but you can't buy sixteen cars. Right? You can, you can, you can only buy a certain number of certain things. 